Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to the uh, third uh, Wireless Distinguished Series uh, at RICE, RICE ECE. Um, so <clears throat> today is actually our greatest pleasure to have uh, Professor uh, Elza Erkip. Uh, professor Erkip is an institute professor at NYU uh, Tandem School of Engineering uh, in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering. Uh, so Dr. Erkip uh, received uh, her bachelor's from Middle East Technical University in 1990 uh, 90, and uh, her PhD uh, from Stanford uh, in 1996, uh, where she worked, she worked with uh, the late information theorist Thomas Cover. Um, Dr. Erkip is actually listed as one of the highly cited researchers by Thomson Reuters in 2014 and 15. Uh, he has won many, many awards, including uh, the uh, CTC Technical Achievement Award in 2018. Uh, Women in Communication Engineering uh, Achievement Award in 2016, an award for advances in communication society in 2013, all from I3P Comstock. And she has won uh, several other uh, best paper awards. Uh, she's a fellow of I3PD for her contributions in uh, multi-user and cooperative communications, and also an elected member of uh, Science Academy Society of Turkey. Um, for those of you who don't know, uh, Dr. Uh, Erkip uh, was actually affiliated with RICE uh, from 1996 to 1999 uh, as a faculty fellow. And so it's really our great pleasure to have you back. Uh, although we really uh, wish that we could actually have you in person uh, and physically, uh, which is not possible at the moment. Uh, but nonetheless, I would like to uh, really welcome you uh, to this virtual series. And uh, uh, with that, I would further ado, uh, I would hand you the floor. Please. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rahman. You can hear me fine, right? Yeah, yes. Okay, I'm new to these AirPods. So, um, you know, it's a great uh, pleasure to be virtually here. And I was uh, happy that Rahman had, as his background, Duncan Hall. Because when I was at Rice, um, you know, we moved into Duncan Hall. So I remember the early days, uh, early days of it. So, um, and thank you for the very nice uh, introduction. Um, so my name is Elza Kip, um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the communications perspective of graph matching today. Uh, I hope I won't take too much of your time. I know that listening to virtual seminars is not the same as being in the uh, same room. Um, so um, I'm a faculty member in NYU Tendon School of Engineering. I'm also a member of Research Center in NYU Wireless, and I'm going to talk about those a little bit before I get to the technical part of my talk. OK, so before talking about uh, graph matching um, and all the cool stuff uh, related to it, um, so um, sorry, I'm trying to see how I can. OK, um, so I want to talk a little bit about who I am. <laughs> Um, and as Rahman uh, mentioned, I spent a few years at Rice, but you know, before that, um, so I grew up in Turkey, went to college in Turkey, but my U.S. journey started in um, 1990 uh, when I uh, went to Stanford uh, to get my uh, master's and, and PhD. Um, I'm an information theorist by training and I knew um, nothing about wireless until I arrived at Rice in 1996. Um, and uh, I was first a visiting assistant professor, uh, then a faculty uh, fellow at Rice. So I spent three wonderful years. Uh, uh, whatever I learned about wireless, I learned it at Rice. Um, you know, thanks to uh, you know uh, my mentor uh, Ben Amajang and and all the various colleagues that I had there. And, and then in uh, 1999, uh, I moved uh, to New York, NYU, uh, where I'm still. Uh, uh, residing and I'm a faculty member here and I'd like to say that uh, you know throughout my journey uh, in the US my hairstyle um, you know improved I <laughs> uh, and I hope you'll, you'll agree with me though my hair at Rice uh, wasn't too bad either um, okay um, sorry I'm 
having a hard time. Okay. Um, so where am I? You know, I'm at NYU, uh, a faculty member at NYU. In fact, uh, you know, I've been spending almost all of my time in Manhattan since uh, March uh, 2020, uh, where I reside. Uh, and as, um, you know, uh, the Hamilton musical likes to say, and, and as cocky uh, New Yorkers like to say, we like to think about uh, Manhattan as where history is uh, happening and it's the greatest city in the world. Unfortunately, it was also the epicenter of the COVID outbreak um, early this spring, um, though our numbers seem to be uh, going down these days. Okay. Um, well, for work, where am I? You know, before March 2020, where did I spend most of my time, uh, most of my waking time at least? Uh, I'm um, in the EC department of NYU Tandon School of Engineering, which is uh, located in Brooklyn. Uh, it's the second oldest engineering school in the United States. It used to be known as Brooklyn Poly, uh, but it has gone through many, many name changes. Uh, when I arrived in, um, uh, in New York in 1991 and um, 1999, it was called Polytechnic University. Hopefully this is our last name. Uh, we're now NYU Tandon uh, School of Engineering. And we merged with NYU in mid 2010s uh, and have been expanding since then. Uh, I'm also a member of NYU Wireless, which is a big wireless research center where we uh, uh, explore 5G and beyond, um, including millimeter wave, massive MIMO, and all the other cool technologies. And we have we currently have 16 uh, member companies. Uh, now, um, so being uh, part of a center like NYU Wireless allows me to interact with uh, uh, people working at various uh, layers of wireless uh, and, and various uh, applications of wireless. Uh, but what do I uh, personally do? Um, coming from an information theoretic background, I've always been interested in theoretical foundations of networks. Uh, and my uh, current uh, research focuses on two types of networks, wireless networks and social networks. On the wireless network side, uh, I've been um, uh, interested in, um, you know, millimeter wave and, and massive MIMO, again, uh, from a foundational uh, perspective. And, and some of my uh, current projects are looking at power consumption of transmitters and receivers, uh, and in particular, how uh, we can ensure a high performance, uh, even though we use low resolution digital to analog and analog to digital uh, converters. Uh, so we have some cool capacity results and, and designs that uh, give us the best performance uh, in uh, the presence of low resolution DACs and ABCs. And I've also been interested in foundations and design of beam alignment uh, techniques uh, in millimeter wave. Um, my other wireless projects include uh, machine learning at the wireless edge, in particular, uh, if a uh, power-limited mo uh, mobile device wishes to carry out a complex machine learning task, how we can optimally offload um, some of the resources uh, uh, to the cloud using the wireless edge, um, how can we rethink about uh, compression in the context of uh, machine learning and limited rate uh, wireless links. Um, in a more uh, general project that takes into account machine learning at the wireless edge is uh, building autonomous robots using 5G millimeter wave technology, where we again uh, use the 5G uh, links uh, to go around the computational limitations uh, of the robots and enable uh, cooperation of multiple robots. Um, in the domain of social networks, I've been, uh, for a number of years now, I've been interested in some of the foundations of web privacy, and that's the topic that I want to talk to you about today, uh, which has led us to a number of uh, cool and interesting insights uh, in graph matching. Okay, um, so, um, you know, coming to the uh, topic of the day, you know, what is graph matching? Uh, and how does it relate to privacy, and what can we do with it? So, you know, um, at a very abstract level, think about two graphs, G1 and G2. Um, suppose they're identical graphs. Uh, G1 has the labels of all the vertices, uh, which in this case is indicated as different colors. G2 vertices do not have any labels, okay? Our goal is to look at G1 and G2. Um, remember, these are identical graphs and use the structure of the graph to uncover 
uh, the vertex labels for G2 to so figure out the colors of the vertices for G2, okay? Um, this is actually a very well-known problem known as graph isomorphism, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, but uh, going beyond identical graphs, what if these two graphs are not exactly the same, but they're correlated? You know, they look very similar. Can we, again, uncover the, the labels of the vertices in G2? Uh, what if uh, we have seeds in that some of the vertex labels in G2 are known to us? Uh, some of the colors are given to us. Can we uncover the colors of the other uh, vertices uh, in G2? Okay, so this is the basic uh, graph matching problem. And I want to talk a little bit about how it relates to, um, you know, uh, uh, some of the practical applications and, and how, you know, communications uh, theory and information theory plays a role in graph matching. Okay, now we can um, also think about graphs as not just uh, consisting of edges and no edges, but we could also envision the edges being multi-valued, and I'll give some examples of that as well. Okay. So this abstract problem of graph matching, uh, in fact, arises in a number of uh, problems and in a number of different fields. Uh, one of them is, is in biology, where uh, you know, people are interested in uh, protein interaction networks of different species, and, and trying to, uh, people try to uncover uh, some of the similarities between these protein interaction uh, networks. In that case, matching of these two graphs consisting, uh, corresponding to different species uh, uh, is a problem of, uh, of importance. Uh, it also arises in image classification where one can think of an image segmentation graph and in classifying an image, one is trying to uh, uh, match multiple graphs uh, corresponding uh, to these image segmentation graphs. Now, my interest in graph matching arose uh, through uh, the privacy angle where, um, you know, I got interested in matching social uh, network graphs. So let me talk a little bit about some of these privacy uh, problems and how they relate to graph matching and, and uh, what's our approach in solving those problems. Okay. So I think everybody, you know, uh, here uh, in this uh, seminar and, and anywhere else would agree with me that um, social network privacy is a very, very important problem. Um, and the, the angle that I'm looking at is through the social network uh, graph. So, uh, so we can view a social network as a graph representing user connectivity. This graph that I'm showing you here is a snapshot of, of Twitter uh, connectivity. Okay. Now, oftentimes, um, social network data is made available um, for advertisement purposes and for research purposes. Um, and in this case, um, typically user identities are removed to maintain anonymity of, of users. This is called uh, anonymization. And in some cases, um, the original social network graph is leaked uh, you know, um, unintentionally. So the question that we ask is, well, is this anonymized data truly private? Um, and, and can we, by looking at other resources over the web, uh, de-anonymize the anonymized social network data? So, so to understand this problem, um, which is the social networking and anonymization problem, um, I'm going to think about two or more um, social networks. Um, and I'm going to think about them as, as graphs that I showed you earlier. And our objective would be, in this case, um, you know, from the perspective of the hacker, is to de-anonymize these social networks, meaning match users in these two networks. So imagine the following problem. Uh, we all have uh, LinkedIn profiles, and we, have, uh, we also have presence on other social networks, such as Facebook, um, Instagram. And in some cases, we may not want our professional um, social network identity, as in LinkedIn, to be matched with our social network uh, identity, say, on uh, to, um, Facebook or, or Instagram. So matching uh, the, these two identities would be a breach of privacy. So the question is, you know, can this be done? It turns out, and uh, this was done more than a decade ago, um, in a landmark paper by Narayana Shmatikov, 
uh, who looked at uh, various publicly available data from Twitter, Flickr, and LiveJournal. Um, and they were able to um, kind of match the identities of users across these three social networks and de-anonymize the users, hence uh, compromising uh, privacy. So indeed, this can be done um, practically, and this was shown more than a decade ago. Now, a similar problem arises uh, when we talk about matching databases, okay? And so, um, you know, a lot of um, databases that, that um, you know, we have over the web contain micro-information um, um, pertaining to users that's shared and published routinely. For example, um, you know, our movie preferences, financial transactions data, location data, health uh, records, voter registration records. Some of these databases are publicly available, uh, such as voter registration records. Some of them uh, are, are uh, strictly privately kept, as in health records, but shared across uh, different researchers and, and with insurers uh, you know, for research or, or for other purposes. And in that case, um, you know, uh, before sharing these databases, uh, there are various um, methods um, you know, applied to this database to maintain anonymity of users. So the question that we ask is, you know, is that uh, anonymized data truly anonymized, okay? Um, so think about um, you know, uh, movie preferences um, as in Netflix, which um, kind of is not publicly available, but it's sometimes made uh, um, available for research purposes by an anonymizing or uh, obfuscating users. And a private, uh, publicly available database such as Rotten Tomatoes. Okay, so the question is, can we match um, these two databases and uncover identities of users uh, in Netflix? Now, uh, the Netflix example is actually an example that occurred in practice. Uh, so, uh, those of you uh, who were watching Netflix more than a decade ago, uh, you know, which certainly includes me, may remember this Netflix um, uh, grand prize where uh, Netflix wanted um, researchers to work on improving um, its uh, recommendation engine uh, and made its data, anonymized uh, the data due to privacy constraints, uh, concerns and made it available for researchers uh, to improve upon its algorithm. However, it turned out that simply anonymizing users was not sufficient to maintain uh, their identities. And again, in a landmark paper, Narayan and Shmatikov showed that using IMDB data, Netflix uh, um, data could be uh, de-anonymized and, and, and some of the privacy of, of the users uh, were compromised. So, so it was possible to match these two databases. Another example that did occur in practice uh, was uh, databases um, uh, consisting of medical records um, were made uh, available in an anonymized uh, fashion to group insurance commission for, uh, for insurance purposes. Now, it turns out that uh, by getting a, a very cheaply available second database, which consists of uh, all the registration data, which simply includes names and addresses of users, uh, Sweeney in 2002 showed that these two databases uh, could be matched. So uh, the medical data and the voter list had only a few um, uh, um, entries in common, such as zip, birth date, and, 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 and sex. Uh, but uh, even using that limited data, Sweeney was able to de-anonymize these medical uh, records, again, compromising privacy. Okay? So we've seen that graphs uh, in practice could be matched um, uh, to compromise privacy. Um, databases could be matched to compromise privacy. But I also wanna talk about some of the good uses of matching databases. Um, so, um, you know, in which cases database matching could be desirable. So uh, for example, imagine a database that consists of data on childhood cancer survivors, okay? some of their treatments, um, you know, their age, when they first had cancer, um, and so on and so forth. Now, typically, it's hard to uh, follow the childhood cancer survivors into adulthood, uh, but we do have plenty of data um, on adult cancer patients. So it would be very nice uh, to be able to match these two databases, uh, which um, 
you know, do not necessarily are, uh, are not necessarily matched to start with. Uh, and know uh, which one of the childhood cancer survivors correspond to which one of the adult cancer patients has furthering our understanding of uh, lifetime cancer incidence of childhood cancer survivors. So there are good applications of cancer, um, of, of database matching as well. Okay? Okay. So I've talked about graph matching and database matching. In fact, um, you know, they're not two separate uh, incidents of, of matching, and database matching can be thought of as an instance of graph matching. How? Uh, so I think of a database as a matrix consisting of rows and columns, right? Uh, each row corresponds to a particular person. The columns correspond to various attributes. So I can view such a matrix as a bipartite graph, right? So the rows are listed on the left-hand side, the columns um, on the right-hand side, and then there are edges connecting rows to columns. Uh, now, uh, these edges could be multi-valued or could be binary valued. Um, so uh, when we have one database uh, for which we know the identities of users, uh, then we will know both the row and column indices. Uh, but, um, you know, when we think about a second uh, database uh, whose um, identities have been, say, anonymized, uh, then we may envision knowing the column colors, but now the row colors. And our goal in database matching is to figure out which rows in the second graph correspond to uh, which rows in the first graph. Okay, so we can view database matching as an instance of graph matching as well. Okay, so we can have a unified approach to both database matching and, and graph matching. Okay, so Coming back to um, you know, this talk, uh, what I'm gonna um, try to answer is how you know, communication theory and information theory can help in understanding uh, graph matching problems, uh, which I hope I've uh, convinced you that have uh, kind of many applications. And for that, we're gonna be looking at graphs that are randomly generated. And that's going to allow us to use tools from communications uh, and information theory, leading to theoretical guarantees and, and new algorithms for graph matching. And I'm going to uh, look at specific uh, examples of this, specific instances of this. First, I'm going to look at database matching, which corresponds to bipartite graphs. Um, and then I'm going to talk about general graph matching, talk a little bit about graphs with seeds and then without seeds, which gives us new um, information theoretic results on the, on the typicality of permutations of sequences. At this point, usually I would stop and say, does anyone have any questions? Uh, you know, um, and I, um, oh, so uh, I see that uh, Ashu has raised his hand, so maybe, maybe we'll take the question uh so as a uh, yes looking forward to the rest of the talk but uh, yes in many of these examples it feels like um there is a understanding of the context which allows people to pull off these de-anonymization right they understand mm -hmm. that somehow movie a movies are related to each other and mm -hmm. mm -hmm. imdb mm -hmm. behavior mm -hmm. so is this implicit in your thought process because you can't just take two random like two yes. different yeah. attributes and they will not correlate or they will not be yeah able to tell certainly certainly yeah. very good question so in fact you know again uh, you know this being it you know looking at the theoretical foundations we're going to make some assumptions about how these two graphs or two databases are correlated right and and we're going to assume that we understand some of the correlations uh, that these two graphs or databases have. Uh, as in the case of, you know, IMDb and Netflix uh, example, right? Uh, um, you know, that both of them contain uh, movie ratings by people and, and, and certain, you know, certain comments. So, so certainly we're, we're gonna make assumptions on the correlations of these two graphs. In fact, our results are gonna tell us uh, um, you know, how much uh, correlation we need to be able to match these two graphs. Uh, and also, um, you know, what kinds of uh, correlations lead us to impossibility in, in graph matching. I hope that answers your question. I, yes, yes, thank you. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Very good. Oh, I'm glad I got a question. Okay, very good. Uh, okay, so, um, 
so continuing, so in the, um, you know, coming back to Ashu's comment, so in the database, you know, first I'm going to look at database matching and I'm going to kind of um, model it in, in very simple terms. And, you know, understandably, all of these theoretical models will be kind of simple to capture some of the basic uh, attributes of these problems. Uh, but, you know, hopefully they have enough of the elements of the reality to move us forward to the next step, which we're kind of working on. Okay, so we're going to envision um, two databases, uh, D1 and D2. Uh, and these databases uh, consist of, um, you know, N members, okay, uh, which correspond uh, to roles. And each member has M attributes, which correspond to columns, okay? Um, and, um, and we're going to um, kind of assume for simplicity that both of these databases have the same number of rows and same number of columns, though, though we think that some of the principles could be uh, carried over if they did not have the same number of rows and columns, okay? And then um, we're going to assume that the entries of these two databases are generated stochastically, okay? Um, so, for example, uh, these could be medical records in hospital one and hospital two. Suppose these are the patients that have been, that have visited both hospitals, okay? We're going to assume that these entries are generated uh, stochastically, um, you know, in a, with each row having an arbitrary correlation and the corresponding matching roles uh, being correlated as well. Okay, so if uh, member number one is Elsa in hospital one, member uh, number one, ideally the matching member uh, would be Elsa in hospital two as well, and the entries would be correlated. But we're going to assume that different roles are independent of the other. Uh, so my medical uh, records are independent of, for example, Ashu's uh, medical records. Okay, we're going to assume that we know the underlying uh, distribution. Okay. So that, those will be our uh, basic assumptions, but we're going to assume for arbitrary distributions otherwise, okay? So I uh, kind of, as my title suggests, I, I want to view this as a communications problem. You know? So where does communications come into play, okay? Let's think a little bit about uh, this database matching problem, right? So I have the first database. I'm going to pick a row from the second database and try to figure out which row in the first database this corresponds to, right? Um, so this random uh, person in the second medical database, uh, which person does it correspond to in the first medical database, right? So we're trying to find the matching row in the first database, okay? Now, one can view this as a way of channel decoding, okay? And here is how, uh, how we think about it, right? So what's our channel coding analogy? So we're going to think of the number of uh, roles in each database, which is N, as the number of messages, right? So these are different people that I'm trying to distinguish between. It's like the, the number of messages that I'm trying to distinguish between when I communicate over an OED channel. Uh, the number of entries, the columns of each database, uh, correspond to the back block length. Right? So that's how many attributes each, each person has. The more attributes a person has, uh, the more information I can collect about that person. And that will be analogous to the block length in a communication system, the block length of your channel code. Okay? And remember that these two databases are correlated uh, with one another, but they're not exactly the same. Uh, so we're going to think of a, a channel getting the first database adding noise and adding distortion and creating the second database, okay? So the correlation between the two databases will be related to, ch to the channel transition probability, okay? Um, and then finally, um, so our database had N rows and M columns. So we're going to define a quantity called the database growth rate, which is um, R, which is the limit as the number of columns goes to infinity of one over m times log n, which is which is going to be analogous to our code for grade. So let's step back and think about this for a second, right? So suppose I have a database for which n is very small, so there are very few rows, but the m, the number of columns, is very large, right? Which means you only have a few people, but you know a lot about those people, okay? 
In that case, it would be relatively easy to, to match two databases, right? Because, um, you know, again, these databases are correlated. You're collecting a lot of information about these people. Now, in that case, when M is large and N is small, the rate would be small, and hence it would be relatively easy to match uh, these databases. On the contrary, when N is large but M is small, when uh, there are only a few attributes for each person but there are a lot of people, it will be very hard to distinguish people, and in that case, the rate would be high, okay? So that's kind of, um, you know, our basic understanding. Um, so our database matching problem, more formally, is given two databases. We're trying to find, um, you know, uh, so these, these two databases are correlated, okay, for the, for the matching roles. Uh, but now we don't know uh, what the matching roles are. And our goal is to find, uh, you know, what that matching is. What's the, um, uh, what's the mapping that tells me uh, who each person is in the second database, okay? And we want almost all entries to be matched correctly, um, as opposed to matching each and every entry correctly, which again allows us to use uh, results from channel code. Okay. Um, so, um, so going back, right? So, um, you know, our results uh, tell us that uh, indeed the growth rate of the database is very intricately related to the correlation of the process that generated these two databases. And in fact, the growth rate, as long as the growth rate of the database is less than the mutual information between the processes that generated the first and the second database, uh, then correct matching is possible. Uh, now, this is very similar to results on, on channel coding. Uh, uh, an information theory, which tell us that if the mutual information between the input and the output of the channel is larger than the rate of our channel code, then successful communication is possible. So in this case, uh, if U1 and U2 are similar to one another and hence the mutual information is large, then we can uh, allow for databases of larger. And this result was shown um, in our paper um, in last year at ISI. Now, um, our results uh, follow uh, um, from ideas of channel coding. Um, and in fact, we can show that uh, we can show the similarity of uh, the, the different corresponding roles in these databases using typicality. Uh, so if, if two roles are typical, then they look uh, similar. Uh, and we can also show that uh, the result is not only necessary, but um, uh, sufficient but necessary um, as well. Now, the differences of this uh, with, with channel coding is that typically in channel coding, we get to design our codes. So this matrix that I showed you would be our code matrix, the database matrix. And then we get to design how we encode our bits. Whereas uh, when we're given uh, databases with certain distribution, the, the distribution of the database is not a design parameter. We're given uh, whatever distribution. Um, that the database uh, came with. And furthermore, we have to match each and every row of the second row uh, of the second database to the, to the first database, uh, which is a little different than uh, our channel coding problem. Okay, so maybe this is another uh, time to stop and see whether you know, there are any further questions. Um, okay, Ashu and Benham. Well, Benham, go first. Yeah. I I'm, think it's strong. I'm unmuted. Yeah. I'm unmuted. Okay. Now, uh, at the beginning, uh, I know that you're going to do that next, but at the beginning, you talked about bipartite graphs, right? Yeah. Now, uh, is there any relevance in this case? Because you now you're talking about um, uh, codes and matrices and all that, therefore, uh, being bipartite or being directional uh, graphs and all that, uh, are there examples or, or discussions on, on either one of them? Yeah, yeah, very good question. So in fact, you know, what I talked about so far was just for bipartite graphs, you know, which are like databases, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and maybe um, kind of going back, right, if I could pull up the, uh, right? So I have these two databases that are um, two matrices. Essentially what I'm doing is I'm given the first matrix 
And then I'm picking a role from the second matrix and trying to figure out which role from the first matrix it looks most like, okay? Now we're gonna see that uh, you can do this if it's a bipartite graph. Uh, because um, you know, you, you're just matching the two rows. It turns out that if you're mapping the full graph, this approach will not work uh, because with graphs, um, you know, uh, things are a little more intricate. And I'm gonna show an example as to what happens with graphs. When you have a wrong labeling, uh, you're kind of uh, changing the whole structure of the graph. So, so the problem becomes a little more complicated. Uh, and you would, the, not have a, you would not have a bound on the rate? We do have a bound on the rate, it's, but it's a little more complicated and it's more, a, a, a bit more difficult to get that result because we can't simply get results from channel coding and apply there because, uh, you know, uh, a wrong uh, matching would mean that not only rows, but also columns are, are permuted. And I'll give an example of that. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Elza, yeah. just maybe it's more of a clarification question. Um, sure. In the two matrices or two databases, mm -hmm. is, the, is it correct that I understood correctly that we are assuming that they have same elements? That means theta i's are same in both of them? Exactly. So my assumption, again, let me go back here. My assumption is that they have the same, okay, so, you know, in the matched case, right? Uh, so, um, they first of all they contain i you know they contain information about the same people mm -hmm. the same n people and the attributes they contain the number of attributes they contain which are the number of columns are also the same now what would be i mean in many of the examples you gave mm -hmm. that doesn't hold strictly right that means exactly some people may not show up in the hospital too or movies or things like that so the subset may show up Yes, yes, is yes. Is there an extension so, you might talk about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, so I'm not going to talk about the extension, though, um, kind of, I think some of these results would apply there, but, you know, um, some of them would have to be retaught. Um, so, so certainly, for example, the second database may contain fewer people, right? Which may not be, you know, as long as everybody in the second database is also in the first database, you could still get away with it, right? Because you're right. taking each, each row and trying to figure out which role in the first database it corresponds to. Uh, but if the number of attributes are different, then, you know, if the number of columns are different, then, then you may have to rethink it. Uh, and I do kind of mention a few extensions, uh, and we've done some work in, in those as well, but I'm not going to talk about them today. Now, another extension is that these rows may be correlated, right? So if we're talking about medical databases, my record and my kid's record may be correlated, right? right. Uh, um, so then uh, we, we think we do have a way of addressing that, uh, but it would be a further extension. Okay, great. Thank you. But those are all very good questions. Yeah, thank Thanks. you. Thanks. Okay. So, um, okay, so, um, okay, so now I want to come back um, to this um, graph matching problem and, and the general graph matching. So when the graphs are no longer bipartite, okay, things get a little more complicated. But, you know, first I want to talk about graphs with seeds where things are not that complicated. Uh, and it kind of has a direct relation to this bipartite graphs and the, and the database matching. Okay. So, um, so kind of let's first look at this arbitrary graph matching problem. So now instead of these databases or matrices or bipartite graphs, I have an arbitrary graph, you know, G1 and G2, you know, which again, I'm going to assume they have the same number of vertices, okay? Um, and then these two graphs um, are correlated, meaning the edges in these two graphs. So imagine, you know, first I know which vertex in G1 is uh, corresponds to which vertex in G2. Then these edges in these two graphs will be generated according to a joint distribution P of X1, X2. You could think of this as uh, kind of one graph is a noisy version of the other. Okay, maybe, um, you know, the, um, you know, I may be, uh, friends, um, you know, say I'm friends with Ashu on LinkedIn, I'm connected on LinkedIn, I'm also connected on Facebook, but there may be colleagues with whom I'm connected in LinkedIn, but not on Facebook, 
uh, in that case, that would be a deletion of NH. Okay, so we have these two graphs, um, and we assume that we know the uh, vertex labels in G1, uh, and these are arbitrary undirected graphs. Uh, we know vertex labels in G1. Our goal is to uncover the vertex labels in G2. Okay, and what we're going to use is, of course, um, you know, the structure of these two graphs, the realizations of these two graphs, but also the underlying correlation. Okay, so we assume that we know the correlation structure. Okay, so, um, you know, these are for um, arbitrary graphs. Now, it turns out that this graph matching problem or graph isomorphism in the case of identical graphs is a problem that has been very, very widely investigated. Um, and in fact, it also goes under the name of network alignment, where the goal is to match two realized networks, and the emphasis is on low complexity methods to match those networks. Um, our approach is kind of thinking of these graphs as random graphs and using the stochastic nature to match them. Um, and in that context, you know, there's been work by uh, Pedar Sand Glasser, uh, Gross Glasser, Kulinia Kiyabash, and, and from our group, uh, you know, for Erdos Schrenyi graphs, where the edges are simple, you know, uh, binary edges, edge or no edge. And then there's been work on ran uh, random graphs with seeds as well, which I'm going to talk a little more about. Uh, and most of these approaches analyze the performance of the optimal mapping, uh, matching strategy, which is maximum or posteriori matching, uh, uh, which on, on one hand is optimal, on the other hand, its performance is difficult to analyze. And we're going to see that a different approach can lead to more tractable uh, results. Okay, so let me step back and talk about random graphs with seeds, right? So remember, in the general graph matching problem, G1 has the vertex labels. G2 doesn't, you know, we've somehow lost the vertex labels and we want to uncover them, okay? Now, in the case of random graphs with seeds, we assume that a few nodes labels are already given to us, okay? Again, in the context of social networks, imagine, you know, famous people, their identities are public in all of the social networks, right? So, so they're people who are known. Okay, so some vertex, la vertex labels in G2 are already given to us. Our goal is to figure out the remaining missing labels in G2. Okay, and then the questions that we ask is, you know, how many such seeds should we have, right? Obviously, more seeds is better for us. And what kind of graph statistics allow us to, uh, to uncover the labels of the remaining vertices in G2? Okay. Now, if you go back and look at the literature on seeded graph matching, most of it looks at um, a particular correlation structure between these two graphs where, you know, one graph uh, um, is an erased version of another graph. And then they mostly look at the conditions on the seed size for this to happen, okay? Now, I'm not going to go through what these uh, works have done, but the the only thing I want you to pay attention is that there's always a lower bound on the seed size for uh, successful graph matching. Um, and then this P and S are, are parameters of the graph, but it kind of looks like a very complicated expression for the number of uh, seeds. Okay? In contrast, we're going to uh, come up with a nice clean uh, condition on the seed size for successful matching uh, to happen. So our seeded graph matching algorithm uh, very uh, closely ties into database matching. And, you know, here's our idea. Suppose I look at all the um, vertices that are seeds. These are the vertices whose identities I know in both graphs. Okay. Now I'm going to look at only, so remember, this is a fully, this could be a fully connected graph, right? So um, many vertices are connected to the seeds, but they're connected among one another as well. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to ignore the connection among different vertices in the network, except for the connections to the seeds. Okay? So I'm going to look at the first graph. I'm going to put the seeds, uh, I'm going to form this bipartite graph. I'm going to put the seeds on the right hand side, the uh, seeded vertices, and I'm going to put all the labeled. Um, vertices on the left-hand side. So now I have a bipartite graph. I'm not looking at the connections among the labeled, uh, other labeled uh, vertices. And I'm going to do the same 
for the unlabeled graph as well. Remember, I know the seeds, so I know the, the right-hand side. My goal is to figure out the colors of the unlabeled ones in G2, okay? Now, notice that this loop, this very much looks like my database matching, okay? In fact, instead of this bipartite graph, I can look at a matrix that describes me this graph. How? So I'm gonna put the labeled vertices as rows and the seeded vertices as columns, okay? And think of a very simple um, connection where edges are binary valued. Either there's an edge or no edge. So if a labeled vertex is connected to a seeded vertex, then I'm gonna put a one in that entry of the matrix. Otherwise, I'm gonna put a zero, okay? So now I'm looking at these two matrices. This is called the adjacency matrix of the, uh, of the bipartite graph. But I'm going to look at these two uh, uh, matrices, and I'm going to try to find which row of the second, um, uh, you know, how to, how to label the rows of the, of the second matrix. So now this is exactly um, the same as my database matching problem, right? where unseeded vertices correspond to rows, uh, seeded vertices correspond to columns, and edges correspond to entries, okay? And I can, again, use the same principle. I can take a row uh, corresponding to the unlabeled uh, graph and try to find which row it corresponds to in the labeled graph, okay? Uh, and if such a row does not exist or it's not unique, our algorithm fails. Now, one difference uh, corresponding um, to um, the database matching is that once I identify the label, um, right, say, once I identify the label of the first row, I'm going to add it to the seeds. So I'm going to redraw these matrices. So then as time goes on, I'm going to get more and more seeds and I'm going to be more and more successful. Okay. Now, again, it turns out that, um, so if we analyze the performance of this and, and find when this algorithm succeeds in matching, uh, we find a condition on uh, the seed size uh, being lower bounded by the following quantity. Now, um, log n is, remember, so there are, um, uh, you know, n uh, vertices in my graph. So if I had log n seeds, right, by looking at the connections, right, log n, uh, um, you know, I would expect if, if every connection gave me one bit of information, then I would expect uh, to uncover the unlabeled vertices. Um, but in this case, our, um, you know, lower bound um, has kind of a reduction, um, you know, or, or a penalty that we pay uh, in terms of I of X1, X2, the mutual information between uh, these two graphs, uh, which accounts for reduction in information in each seed, uh, that each seed node uh, provides. Now, because, that, because these two graphs are not perfectly correlated, and because each edge information does not give me uh, one bit of information. I have a reduction, I of x1, x2, which for binary valued edges is typically smaller than one. So I'm going to need more than log and number of seeds for successful matching. Okay. So essentially, what this shows us is that when I have, um, you know, seeded graphs, uh, then I can view this as a bipartite graph and look at only the connections to the seeds and use this analogy to channel coding and to database matching to figure out how many seeds do I need uh, and what kind of correlation uh, uh, do I need for successful matching of these two graphs, okay? Now, um, so what I want to talk about next is the more complex version, which is graphs without seeds, okay? So, so now I'm looking at arbitrary graphs. Uh, and there are no seeds, okay? Now, to kind of talk about those, I want to um, give a very brief overview um, on the adjacency matrix of a graph, okay? So uh, think about the first graph here. There are four nodes, okay? One, two, three, four. One is connected to four, two is connected to four, three is connected to four. I can list all these connections into, um, in, an, in an adjacency matrix with four rows and uh, four columns. 
where the ij entry tells me whether node i is connected to node j or not. Uh, if they're connected, I get a one. If not, I get a zero, okay? And then here are some examples for different graphs. Um, now, of course, because this is an undirected graph, the adjacency matrix is symmetric. So if node i is connected to node j, then node j is connected to node i as well. Okay, so this ends up being a symmetric matrix. Now, here's a um, kind of um, a question that Venom asked earlier. Um, you know, how does this relate to database patching? Okay, so suppose that um, I have a, a graph represented by this adjacency matrix, you know, with four vertices, and I flip the labels of vertex one and vertex three. Okay, so that would mean I'm going to have to flip row one and row three but only not only the rows but also column one and column three as well so in a graph that's not necessarily bipartite whenever i switch the labels of the two nodes then i'm gonna have to switch not only the rows but also the columns of the adjacency matrix okay so um so this is the main difference between a general graph and a bipartite graph or a general graph matching and database matching in databases if i mislabel entries it only affects the corresponding rows i only kind of flip the labels of the corresponding rows whereas in graphs mislabeling two vertices means not only the rows but also the columns uh, will have to be flipped as well okay so i'm gonna have to use a little more sophisticated tools I hope that clarifies Benham's um, earlier question. Okay. Um, so again, you know, database matching versus um, you know graph matching turned out to be a little different because with databases, I only needed to match the roles. For graph matching, I'm going to look at the whole adjacency matrix and see how I can match those. Okay. So we're going to have to um, you know, invoke the notion of typicality of adjacency matrices. How two correlated adjacency matrices corresponding to G1 and G2 look alike or not in a stochastic fashion, okay? And for that, we're gonna recall that these adjacency matrices are symmetric. Hence, if I have N rows and N columns, I don't have to look at all the N squared entries. I only have N times N minus one over two entries to look at, okay? And I'm gonna think of an adjacency matrix as a sequence of bits uh, that's of length n times n minus one um, over two, okay? And then I can view it as a sequence of bits, and I can you know, talk about notions of typicality which tell me whether two adjacency matrices look alike or not, right? Uh, again, you know, our goal will be look at um, graph one and adjacency matrix of graph one and graph two and see how I can label graph two, uh, figure out an adjacency matrix that looks like the adjacency matrix of graph one, okay? So it turns out we can use um, notions of typicality here. I don't have to go through uh, kind of uh, this math, but uh, you know, what it simply tells you is that if you have the correct labeling, these two adjacency matrices of these two graphs are gonna look alike, okay? Are gonna be typical. And, and we know exactly what looking alike means given a certain level of correlation. Okay. Um, so then, um, you know, um, our, um, our goal again would be to look at the adjacency matrices of graph one and graph two and figure out the labeling for graph two, kind of just uh, move up, uh, around the rows and the columns until G1 and G2 are typical. They look like they've come uh, from the same um, distribution. And that's going to be uh, what we're going to do for graph matching. Okay, so we're going to find the labeling on G2 such that it looks like uh, G1. Now, in order to argue that, um, I was hoping to finish early, but you know, um, uh, I think virtually, uh, when it's virtual, you know, one tends to talk a lot. Um, uh, but you know, we're, we're going to Kind of in order to ensure that the strategy works, we're going to have to argue that when you have the wrong labeling, right? Uh, if you have not found the right labeling for G2, 
then its adjacency matrix should not look anything like the adjacency matrix of G1, and hence it should not be typical uh, with the adjacency matrix of, of uh, G1. So for that, we're going to have to uh, talk about you know, permutations of random vectors. Remember, wrong labeling corresponds to permutation of the adjacency matrix. OK? And that leads us to um, kind of understanding uh, what happens when you take two random sequences that are correlated with one another. And suppose you permute one of the, one of the sequences and see how, um, how it kind of relates to the original sequence and whether it looks typical or not. And it turns out that permutations of sequences uh, have a few important parameters that are important in this context as well. Okay, so, um, so let me um, kind of go through this example. Suppose you have a sequence y1 through y5 and you permute it. Okay, so I call this pi of y5 y, uh, of length 5. And my permutation is that I've changed uh, y1 and y2's location, I flip them around. Then I change y3 and y4's location, I flip them around. Y5 remains where it is. Okay. So in this case, Y5, uh, the fixed location would be a fixed point, right? It has not moved at all. So there's only one fixed point in this permutation. And then uh, there are two cycles, one and two traded places, three and four traded places, okay? Um, so those are called uh, two cycles. Uh, so C is two. And the length of these cycles are two. So meaning only two entries traded places, okay? So it turns out that you get a sequence and you permute it, then you can always identify the number of fixed points, number of non-trivial cycles, and length of these cycles. And it turns out that when we try to figure out whether the permuted sequence is typical with the original sequence or not, the only thing, the only parameters that matter are the number of fixed points, the number of non-trivial cycles, and the length of those cycles. Um, and then, um, you know, I'm not expecting people to, to, to follow the slide has a lot of uh, kind of uh, math, but it's, you know, the, the essence is that mm. this allows us to look at two sequences, X and Y, that are correlated with one another. We know that since they're correlated, when we kind of try to match them, they're going to look typical, okay? But now suppose I permute y because I have a wrong label in the second graph. Now in that case, x and the permuted y being jointly typical has a probability that can be upper bounded as follows. And it has a nice uh, kullback leibler distance term here, um, you know, which relates to the number of, of fixed points. And just to kind of give you a quick idea, when m is zero, meaning there are no fixed points, then it's a totally different permutation. This term uh, in the exponent becomes the mutual information between x and y, which tells that tells us that x and, and a permute a totally random uh, permutation of y um, have a low probability of being jointly typical, and that probability decays with the exponent of the mutual information between x and y. And if um, m is equal to n, meaning uh, y has not been permuted at all, uh, then this exponent um, kind of becomes, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, z, you know uh, very large, which means that x and y, the original y, are typical with very large probability. Okay. And then it turns out that we can put this together to talk about uh, conditions for graph matching to be successful or not. And as you can see, the condition for the success of this graph matching is considerably more complicated than database matching, again, because it involves all these uh, intricate details, um, you know, about uh, permutations of, of graphs. Okay. So um, I'm sorry I could not finish early, but, you know, I want to conclude uh, with a few thoughts. So um, I hope I've uh, kind of um, managed to um, 
you know, convince you that database and graph matching are interesting problems. Uh, there's a rich literature in systems level approach, getting to graphs and kind of hacking them and showing that they can be matched. Our approach has been probabilistic using simple probabilistic models and tools from uh, communications and information theory to come up with new ways of matching graphs and necessary and sufficient conditions for success. Um, you know, there were a number of good questions about um, kind of how do we get rid of these simplifying assumptions. So in database matching, uh, you know, one um, avenue we've been looking at is that getting these databases could be costly, right? So we see that if we have more columns, then it's easier to match, but maybe getting access to those columns could be costly, okay? as in you have to uh, kind of scrape the web and harvest more information. This relates to notions of reckless codes and feedback in communication systems, and I'm happy to discuss more if you're interested. And it relates to uh, um, you know, privacy problem uh, called fingerprinting, which we've done some work as well. And in graph matching, you can think about matching more than two graphs, matching partially labeled graphs, partial vertex overlap and community structures and preferential attachment models. And uh, we have uh, results on some of these. And some kind of very raw ideas just to throw at, right? So I've been thinking whether we can think about contact tracing uh, for, for fighting against COVID-19 um, as an incidence of graph matching. And the idea that I had is that, you know, suppose we have information about people uh, you know, through uh, public and private databases uh, and connections, right? And we can think about infected people as seeds. And our goal is to identify who has been in touch with those infected people over a period of time, okay? So can we view this as a graph matching problem where we're only identifying neighbors of infected people? And of course, you know, this results in further uh, privacy concerns. Uh, about uh, you know connections in the in the grand populations that we can get, and with that I'm going to stop. Um, you know I have um, kind of a number of references uh, for those of you who are interested, uh, and I'll take any questions uh, that people may have. Yeah, thank you so much, Elsa, for the great talk. Thank you. Uh, yes, I guess we're going to open the floor. Um, yeah, the questions are trickling in. Uh, so I guess the, I, I'm going to read the questions since not everybody can see them and then you can actually answer. Um, so the first question is from Santiago. Uh, mm -hmm. So um, in the case where you have seeds, uh, where, uh, you, you use the one hop neighborhood signature of the other of other nodes with respect mm -hmm. to the seeds as your code. Can you improve the required number of seeds by looking at a larger neighborhoods, like two hops yeah. and three hops? Very good question. Um, yes, indeed, kind of the results uh, were just focused on one hop, right? Just the connection of the unlabeled nodes to the seeds. Uh, we have not looked at it, uh, right? Um, and again, in, in certain cases, this seems to be enough, uh, but certainly a, a very good uh, question. So, so in a way, looking at two hop and three hop, would bring in both the, the notion of seeds, nodes whose labels are known, and the notion of general graph matching, where we're looking, where we're not just looking at one hop connections, but we're we're looking at the complete graph structure. Um, so yeah, uh, we have not looked at it, but certainly you know there's some work out there, uh, and there's a lot to be done. Okay, good question. I guess Benham has a question. Um, Elsa, um, yes. I wanted to uh, sort of ask you about applications, right? You, at the beginning, mm -hmm. you mentioned about applications. Um, mm -hmm. As you, I, I can imagine that in many, many applications, you've got tons of data, right? Mm -hmm. but, uh, then the question is, uh, uh, what else do you need uh, in terms of, uh, would you compute uh, correlations of the different data points or data, data set or signals? And, uh, you know, what are some uh, sort of stochastic or uh, probabilistic uh, connections or features do you need to sort of, to sort of say something about uh, matching, uh, you know, in, in one of the examples that you mentioned? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So again, right, so in all of these, we, we took a very simple approach. We said, somebody gives us the correlation of these graphs, right? And, and mind you, these are very simple graph models, right? 
I guess, Ben, what you're asking is, well, if I don't know the correlations, you know, what can I do? Oh. Uh, you know, can I maybe first look at the graphs and, and try to infer, infer correlation, maybe using seeds, um, you know, as a way to infer the correlation and then use that known correlation to apply some of these algorithms? Um, you know, very good questions. You know, is, is this two-step approach the best? You know, can you do a universal uh, matching if you don't know the underlying uh, correlation or the stochastic process, but you know it comes from a family? Very good questions, answers, I, you know, uh, I don't know yet. Uh, again, right, so the, the literature on graph matching actually looks at, for example, algorithms, right? So for what kinds of graphs can you do the matching? Uh, but they don't come necessarily come with theoretical guarantees saying for these types of graphs, you can do it for these types of graphs, you cannot. Um, and I guess our approach was, was trying to uncover that. And there's a lot to do in between these two. Does that, I hope that answers your question. Yeah. You somehow you turn my questions to a, to a much better question than, than I started from. But no. yeah. I learned you. from you, Benno. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, so actually, uh, there's one more, one more question uh, from Yasaman, which is actually my question too. So the question is now with these database matching insights, uh, uh, what are your thoughts about new data anonymization mechanisms? Exactly, and, and that's also a very good question, right? So actually where we started from was, okay, so if we know conditions which uh, tell us, right? So the, uh, uh, the impossibility conditions, you know, if uh, the correlation is less than the following or the mutual information less than a certain amount, then for sure you cannot do uh, matching, right? So uh, we have, um, you know, both necessary and sufficient conditions. So the question is, you know, how do you make sure that the databases, um, you know, are they, uh, operate in that regime or graphs operate in that regime? Now, looking at that, though, um, kind of requires, um, I mean, of course, there are all these differential privacy methods and all that such uh, things, right? You know, you could add noise, but it also requires us to look at, you know, what kind of utility we want to derive from these graphs, right? So if it's a graph uh, over which I want to compute something, and that's why, you know, we anonymized it and we made it available for research purposes, we also need to make sure that by adding noise, and kind of uh, making it uh, further away, uh, you know, from the other graph, we're not losing that information. Um, I think for that, you know, one could of course argue over some abstract utility measures, or one could look at, you know, what you intend to do with that graph, and from that derive kind of a, a utility measure that, you know, works. You know, if, if it's a graph over which you want to do inference, right? Can you mathematically model your uh, metric for inference and then see how much noise you can add or how much uh, kind of further uh, stochasticness you could inject uh, to make sure that the graphs are not matchable? But certainly a very good question. Yeah. Okay. All right. So I guess uh, we have answered all the questions. Uh, thank you so much, Elsa, again. Yeah. Uh, for joining us today for the great talk. Uh, mm -hmm. I guess I enjoyed your talk. Everyone else enjoyed. Hope. Uh, and then with that, we're going to actually end our third Distinguished uh, mm -hmm. talk today. And mm -hmm. I would also like to thank everyone for joining this, this talk today. Yeah. Thank, thank you, you so much for the invitation and very nice seeing you. Bye-bye. You too as well. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.